uh, oh, which right. words in particular? Well, let's. I would say let's <laughs> let's start. <laughs> so now uh, for the second part of this double feature, we will have Markus Sperling, who will tell us about decay and fission of magnetic rivers. Take it away. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining and on a Friday afternoon. And uh, thanks, Antoine, for you know doing the groundwork. Um, so the plan for the second part is essentially that I want to go through a complete example. So here, really, a complete example where we know everything in terms of classical Higgs mechanism, and then we go through decay and fission and growth subtraction, and just uh, just reiterate what are the differences and what are the points that we can now take away. And once we have this uh, cleared up. I quickly show the uh, mathematical notebook that is also available on uh, Antoine's website, and then we're going to have some applications to some more interesting theories in four, five, and six dimensions. And then the end, we uh, have a summary and hopefully some discussions. Um, so let's jump into an example, um, complete example in the sense that we uh, know already everything that happens on the Higgs branch, because we start from a Lagrangian theory with an SU5 gauge theory that has uh, a number of fundamental hypermultiples and two anti-symmetric hypermultiples. So here we can, as Antoine has introduced in the beginning, already trace out the, the nested singularities of the Higgs branch by using partial Higgsing, in particular branching rules. And that would give you a, a diagram or graph that is the one on the right-hand side. So here I start on the bottom. That's basically the origin of the Higgs branch. There's no vacuum expansion value un, uh, turned on. The gauge group is completely unbroken. And then I start uh, tuning the vacuum expansion values to some minimal thing that I break the gauge group in some sense to a, a smaller group. And then in the end, if I trace it out everything, I get this nice diagram. And for the same uh, theory, we can actually do the, the entire process of either decay fission or course reflection because we know what's the magnetic river. So at the beginning, I just briefly review, uh, in case you have not seen this before, how to get the Higgs and Schaffer diagram from partial Higgsing just in two examples to uh, illustrate the, the message. So we start, for instance, by um, the, the, the point at the bottom, so SU5. And then the first step to do is just to uh, write down all the possible continuous subgroups of this SU5. And then all these possible subgroups, they already uh, endow a natural partial order just by inclusion. But then, of course, you still need to check whether you can actually consistently Higgs to that subgroup. And that comes, uh, or that's the point where you need to check the, the branching rules. So you need to check whether actually uh, all the, the fields that are not any longer living in the adjoint of the SU5. So that thing that should become a, a massive W boson actually is becoming a massive W boson. All right, so you need to make sure that starting from the adjoint of SU5, decomposing it into the adjoint of SU4 plus everything else, you need to make sure that everything else really becomes massive such that the residual gauge theory is really just an SU4. Uh, in order to do so, we need to also decompose the, the matter market bed. So we need to decompose the fundamental and the anti-symmetric and we do so and then we see that everything that is not a joint uh, of SU4 can indeed be compensated by something in the meta bits, such that we find the residual gauge theory is again an SU4 theory, which has fundamental matches, and the number of fundamentals is remaining the same as four, and we have two anti-symmetrics, and that's it. And we can also compute the, uh, or we can also compute the dimension of this transition by counting what are the a number of gauge thing that's appearing. So we see the decomposition of the fundamental has one thing that appearing. So we have four fundamentals, but then we need to make sure that also the adjoint has this uh, one uh, gauge thing that here. So in the end, we have four minus one is a three dimensional transition. All right, so, so that's how we get this from branching rules. And that will be an example of the decay, really in the sense as before, we have a single gauge group and we reduce it to a smaller gauge group. An example for fission would be the other way that we break the gauge group into a product gauge group. So that will be SU3 times SU2. You do the same exercise. You uh, decompose all the multiplets in your matter fields plus the adjoint of the SU5. And you make sure that everything that is not the adjoint of the residual gauge theory or the potential uh, residual gauge theory really becomes massive. Right? And, and again, uh, here we're in a very fortunate situation that actually, even though we break to a product gauge group, all the matter fields, all the representations that would potentially be charged under both gauge group factors now cancel out such that the residual gauge theory is really just a product of SU3 with six fundamentals and SU2 with four fundamentals. And again, you can do the count of the dimension. That is, you check there's one thing that in the decomposition of the anti-symmetric, you have two of those, minus one uh, gauge thing that appear in the decomposition of the adjoint. So in the end, you get a one dimension transition. Right. So that, that's the classic X mechanism. Here we know how things work. 
and we're quite happy. Now, of course, we want to contrast it with something new, and that's uh, the the you know the, the topic of today. And therefore, we want to apply the decay in fission. And here, I want to show you um, the mathematical notebook that we have uh, put out. Therefore, I slightly stop sharing and I do reshare. I hope you still see other things. Right. So that's the, yep, the notebook. And um, so there's there's some part here that says code. You essentially just have to execute this one. Um, and then there's some examples which uh, we already put in. But for now, I just want to uh, show you the example that uh, is on, on the slide. So the example is defined by such a matrix. That is the adjacency matrix that Antoine has mentioned. So you see on the uh, diagonal, you have the minus twos. And then you have the, the ones decorating, uh, showing you basically what are the bifundamentals between the different gauge groups indicated by this rank vector here. So the first thing that we can do is we can just check that we actually have to find the, the same quiver that we want to, to look at. So we just execute this and then we see, okay, um, this is indeed the, the quiver. It has one, two, uh, has one, three, five, three, one, and then two ones on top, right? So once we are sure that we're having the, the correct quiver, we can then apply actually the algorithm, which is just called fission decay. Green and is blue, we blue is overbalanced. Sorry. Yes, is blue is overbalanced and green is balanced, correct, correct. Um, right. So once we're happy with the quiver, we hit the, the, the program, and then you get a list of all these um, quivers, which then correspond to the leaves. And then you get also the diagram of where they are supposed to sit, right? And then you see that the starting point, so the, the, the two quiver six is here at the bottom. And then for some reason, the, the arrow is pointing in the other way is in my slide, but the, the way you should read this at the bottom is the six. And then you see there is a five, which is a quiver we will discuss in a moment. And there's an eight here that is indeed this fission uh, product. What happens and, if you uh, get a bad quiver in the program? Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't do anything. It, it has to be good at the beginning. Okay, okay. Yeah. Maybe a related question. Why do uh -huh. you have zeros in the middle? I could imagine setting every node to zero except the two very bottom blue nodes and having them be two disconnected ones. Why does something like this never happen? This again, you want to set everything to zero except the everything two to zero except the two that are one at the top in that picture. If you so see those that. two. Uh, okay, sure. Set everything to zero except those two. But then the twos are not good anymore. Mm. I mean, if you just have the single two, so two is not good, right? That's so not the a valid reason you, The reason you get away from, okay, so this is somehow the reason why you don't get some completely horrendous number of things, the restriction that the, the thing be good. Right. The restriction is you start from the same adjacency matrix, you just reduce the rank vector, and the quiver needs to be good, defined mm. by these conditions. Okay. Okay. Very good. In in the in the picture that I showed, you know, with the dots and the lines, so the, yes. you're you're really in a cone. So you are the intersection of a lattice and a cone, which is quite narrow. Actually, so most most lower quivers are not good. Only those which are inside this cone are good, and that's what. Mm -hmm. I see. Very good. Thank you. Okay. What's the uh, computation cost of this procedure? This particular thing. Well, I just did it live, so that was, uh, I would say, less than a second or two seconds. It is very fast, even for the for the big quivers I show in the, in the back. It's uh, very fast. So it's not exponential in uh, that time. Okay. No, it, it should be quadratic uh, in the total number of rank. Numbers. So you, you you can you can put a quiver of dimension I don't know fifty, and it will still do it in less than a second. Let's see. So that, that's that's a, um, uh, also another difference with the uh, quiver subtraction algorithm, at least the code we have, which is very complicated because you need to scan through a very large number of subquivers. And so all of this is avoided here. Um, I see. OK. Yeah. OK, thanks. Let me uh, share again now the slides, if I can find them. Here we go. Right. Uh, right, long story short. So the first step the algorithm does, as you have seen, it just gives you a list of covers and then you need to arrange them according to how they're ordered. And that is basically the diagram here. And then first observation is that the covers that you obtain are indeed the magnetic covers for the theories after Hixing. 
So if you look at the SU5, you go to SU4, and then you get uh, this corresponding magnetic river. This is indeed the magnetic river for this theory. Similar, if you would look at the uh, fission into two, so the SU3, SU2, you need to get a product of the corresponding magnetic rivers, right? So that is the, the point to appreciate. The second step is then that we compute the transition geometries as a secondary step. And for the decays, as uh, advertised before, it's really just quiver subtraction. You start from the initial quiver minus the final quiver, you do quiver subtraction, and you get the, the corresponding quivers that describe the uh, transition geometry, right? And uh, then the next step would be, of course, now we can compare to the other algorithm that we already had, and we can see what is the difference. And the difference should be, uh, well, first of all, you see there's now two sets of quivers, and you have sort of you know two, two types of arrows pointing in different directions um, because they describe different things. So what, what do they describe? The quivers that we obtained from quiver subtraction, they, as I said before, they describe the magnetic quivers for the theories after Higgsing. So if you think about um, those vertices describing the synthetic leaves, then they describe always the transverse slice to the top. On the other hand, if we go to quiver subtraction, then we always compute quivers for the symplectic leaf. So we describe something starting from this point, point to the bottom, which is the closure of the symplectic leaf. Right? So, so that's why the quivers being at the same vertex in the Hassel diagram do describe different things. One describes the transfer slice to the top, the other one describes the leaf. You also see that the shape of the quivers as advertised is substantially different. On the left-hand side, everything is just defined by the uh, adjacency matrix that defines the initial quiver. On the right-hand side, God knows what's coming out because you have a set of, uh, a set of or you have a set of uh, minimal degenerations that you are allowed to subtract, and then you, you do whatever it comes out, and then you see that the, the, the quivers are very, very differently looking. You have to introduce decorations. You can get non-simply laced uh, quivers from a quiver that is simply laced at the beginning. So therefore, um, both algorithms compute different things, but they can be used in synthesis to extract the entire information that we want to know. Yes. Um, can, can you consider this as um, some uh, slice in an affine Gassmannian of some affine type uh, algebra? Uh, what was the question there? This uh, quiver in particular? The, yeah, the, the, this, yeah, this sub diagram as a slice in an affine Gassmannian. Maybe, but... Uh, yeah. hmm? I don't think so. No? Of a fine type. But, but it's uh, okay. not, not but, just a fine, but like there are two overextended nodes. Anyway. I mean, here the, the, the message is just you have this quiver and you, you compute the half diagrams. If the quiver happens to be a quiver in some of the fine yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But it's not so much depending on the algorithm than on the theory that you're looking at. So okay, it's indefinite, indefinite. Like, I see. Can you explain uh, what this means, Paul? Okay, I, I don't want to. Uh, so okay, thank you. Yep. Um, uh, okay, then any questions further to this point? Otherwise, I'm going to go to some examples in other dimensions. So just to clarify, the reason why oh. the quivers are different is that on the left, you compute slices, and on the right, uh, closures of leaves. If we yes, could... we compute. Yeah. Yes, the left computes slices to the top, right? Because they are magnetic groups of the theories after Higgsing, so they compute the, the Higgs branches uh, above each point in a slice uh, in a in a leaf, and the right one computes the closures of the leaves. Okay. Very good. Right, then after this uh, complete example where we had the full information on the Higgs branch already beyond or be before using the magnetic quivers, we can now go to examples where we have, uh, where we are in a less fortunate situation where we sometimes do not know the entire information already. And the first example is one of these uh, four dimensional algebraic Douglas theories, in particular one that is defined by a sphere with one regular and one irregular puncture, which is in this particular example, a so called D9SU6 theory. And for those theories, we are in the fortunate situation that various people in the audience have computed the magnetic rivers. So we can literally just take the magnetic river and plug it in the algorithm. Then the starting point is this quiver here at the bottom. So it's composed of a uh, TSU type tail and a complete graph with some uh, vertices in between. 
And then you just plug it in in the in the diagram or in the in the algorithm, and you you generate this diagram. Here, in terms of color, the black one or the black transitions are decay transitions, whereas the red ones are fission transitions. And generically, we expect two types of uh, hexing: one triggered from the regular puncture and one triggered from the irregular puncture. So let's uh, see them a little more in detail. For these uh, DPSUN theories, there's an expectation that if uh, P is larger than N, that one can fully close the regular puncture. That would mean that from the starting point of this irregular and uh, fully regular puncture or maximal regular puncture, that we have a successive uh, steps of decays that will completely eradicate this full puncture and close the puncture completely. That means we replace the one to the six by six, meaning in terms of the magnetic river that we completely remove the TSU tail. But in terms of the uh, decay fission algorithm, that this uh, quiver here is contained in the Hasse diagram of this magnetic quiver is fairly obvious because by the definition of decay and fission, anything that is defined by the same adjacency matrix with a rank vector that is smaller and still defines a good vector has to show up in this Hasse diagram. Right? So that you can delete this TSUN tail is just straightforward by the definition of uh, the Kuhner bunch Hasse diagram of this magnetic quiver. In addition, of course, you see then that since you can fully close this puncture, you can also go subsequently to all the possible uh, partitions in between of six. And then you see that this part of the hazard diagram is then reproducing the partial order of the partitions of six. Yes, Ami. Hey, can, can you say uh, what happens to the generators of the ring of functions as you move uh, within this uh, diagram? Is there some operation which happens? which acts on them? Maybe. I haven't thought about it too much. Because then, then um, so in the, in the physical system, you, you will have uh, a, set, a set of generators and you, you, you get some degenerations and you want to see some kind of uh, evolutions of those generators. Um, I mean, so those ones are, you know, you have a, a flavor symmetry and you turn on a, a near partition graph and then you, you break from from one to six to a smaller partition. But so so what, what precisely do you mean by evolution? Do, is that anything beyond uh, giving a near partition graph? So the the simplest thing, you know, if you, if you talk about uh, regular Higgsing, mm -hmm. Um, of things we understand, uh, you say, okay, there is a Higgs mechanism, and you have uh, some gauge fields which become massive, and you, you're reducing the number of degrees of freedom. And, uh, so explanations along these lines. Um, I don't know what's the right thing. This is the adjoint Higgs mechanism, though, basically. Yeah, yes, yeah, column branch Higgs in for this group. So you could start with UK with N flavors, you reduce the K. That's basically what's happening. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I mean that, that right. So remember the. So then it's I remember the this... functions even like we know which ones go away. Yeah. So remember the the three D medicine tree setup. You have uh, the Higgs bar chasing on one side, and you have the Coulomb bar chasing on the other side. And mm -hmm. and that one also tells you why the shape of the quiver has to be the same, right? Because the only thing that they're moving is really just uh, uh, the three brains uh, off along the NS brains. Um, so the, the shape of the quiver and the position of the flavors is the same. So the shape uh, is uh, invariant under this hexing. Right. In contrast to to the hexing hexing, where you do move the flavors around, but then the invariant quantity is the the balance instead of the shape. That that's the key feature of adjoint hexing, right? So the right. The key, the right. Key flavors, you go to UK minus one with n flavors and one u one that's on its own, and so then we can describe exactly what, like we know how the ring changes even here. Yeah, we can do it quite explicitly. Okay, good. Please continue. Okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, right. So now we we uh, quickly have seen the regular puncture, but then there's also, of course, the irregular puncture. Uh, and now it's not moving. Oh, here we go. So the the irregular puncture is also expected to sometimes contribute Higgs branch uh, directions, uh, but as far as I'm aware, it's, uh, less uh, systematically understood. In terms of the magnetic quiver, we know that the irregular puncture is essentially encoded in the complete graph. And we know from the examples studied that the complete graph then can either trigger decay or fission. 
So in the, in, in the example here, this is already one of the cases where the uh, puncture is partially closed. So the TSU tail is already slightly removed. Um, but then we see that this quiver can actually fission into something like this. That would mean that we uh, fission the, uh, this, the theory defined by a sphere with a uh, node maximum with a regular puncture and an irregular puncture into a theory which is defined by a regular irregular puncture times just a sphere with an irregular puncture. Right. On, on the other hand, if we move one step further in, in decay and then uh, we're having a theory like this, then we see here that actually the complete graph can now trigger a decay because in, in this uh, next step, we see that the complete graph is removed by one node. Right. So an irregular puncture can undergo both decay as well as fission. Okay. Now, next is that we can apply the sort of the, the algorithm also to various uh, 5D SCTs, so for which we're in a very fortunate situation that there's a, a long list and catalog of magnetic quivers that we can look at. So what okay. we essentially did, yes. Um, sorry for the many interruptions, but no worries. In the class S theory, so the rank mm -hmm. drops, right, of the sort, do you have some brainy way of thinking about this or some? Uh, you mean uh, in here? Down here, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, not quite yet. Okay. Not quite yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, apparently, there is some um, there's some paper by Dan Shea that uh, Lorenzo has uh, pointed out to me that okay. apparently captures this somehow, maybe, but um, I'm not quite sure yet how to translate. Mm -hmm. So this goes from SU six to two SU four. Yes. Mm -hmm. But in general, could it be different ones? Have you looked at those examples or? Uh, what, what do you mean different ones? So like, like oh, you did the product being different ones? Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is mm, a I think for the ones we have looked at, not, but uh, maybe. Mm, okay. not sure, not sure. Right, um, and, and so going back to the 5D theories, so essentially the, the, the thing that we did is we looked at 5D SQCD theories with uh, some fundamental and one anti-symmetrics. And then we know there's a the variety of families, which are sort of here drawn in these columns. And in, in a family, so the, the number of colors and numbers of flavors is uh, linked. And then there's some transparent server, and then the families sort of change or differ by how this relation between color and flavor and the transparent level is, is about. And then what we do is we just take the magnetic reverse for these various SQCD theories. We compute the first generation of decay products. And then we identify back which uh, F5D SQCD theory this magnetic curve could correspond to. Then, of course, you see there's the, the to be expected Higgsings, uh, which remain in the same family. So that's usually fundamental flavor Higgsing. But then there's also a variety of uh, Higgsings that go in between um, these SQCD different families. And so that, that's kind of one nice way how you can, can then use this algorithm to really interconnect various types of 5D SQCD theories and then potentially other or complicated larger theories, right? And then finally, for um, the last example in my last uh, seven minutes, is uh, some six dimensional theories for which we also know there's a variety of different uh, studies have been going on in the past. Here, I want to look at a simple example, which is four and five brains on an eight type singularity near the M9 domain wall and the trigger embedding into the eight holonomy. And then we get a 60 equivalent description, which uh, looks like this. So we have the the eight global symmetry on the right hand side, and then we have a ramp of SU gauge uh, algebras going to the left. Uh, we know those magnetic quivers, and now what we do is, is again the same. We want to use the magnetic quiver to study the hexamental G flows of this six dimension phase. You can take this very, very long looking quiver, and you know, you see there's a rank of 24. You can type it into the uh, mathematical notebook, and you can hit enter. If you hit enter, you get a diagram which doesn't look as beautiful as this one, but after some rearranging, you get a diagram that looks sort of like this. And then you can see there's a lot of uh, things going on. There's a lot of decay going on. There's a lot of fission going on. So what you then do as an exit is you then translate back the magnetic quivers into six dimensional theories. And then you get a diagram like this. And again, there's a lot of things that we, we, we can look at. There's of course, uh, decay transitions or sort of uh, near put and take things that most of, of you will be mostly familiar with. So for instance, if we look at the starting point here, we see it has an EA global symmetry factor here. If we then um, sort of hex this away, or if we shrink this minus one curve, we get an EA transition. We get a, a new theory, which is defined by a curve configuration with three curves. And now the global symmetry on the empty minus one curve is an E7, because there's an SU2 gauge symmetry here. 
We can further hex this one again, then we get a curve going equation with two. Now there's a gauge symmetry on the uh, minus one curve. We first of all hex the, the gauge symmetry away, then we get an empty minus one with an E6 curve symmetry, and so forth. So we can hex systematically the flavor symmetry on the right hand side until we reach the E string theory, and then we do the final EA transition. So this one is, uh, I assume, mostly understood. Um, then you can also see there's um, fissions. So if you, for instance, hex the flavor symmetry on the left hand side, you get a six dimensional generalized quiver description, which looks like this which can undergo a fission, this one in particular. So how do we understand this fission in terms of magnetic quivers and in terms of uh, thick dimension theories? So in terms of magnetic quivers, the starting quiver for, for this theory here is uh, something like this. And now the, the corresponding quivers on the right-hand side is essentially this quiver minus an affinate thick and diagram quiver, which would be the, the corresponding quiver for the Eastern theory. And now we also see why this fission is possible, because we see basically if you align this uh, affinity Dinkin diagram with this initial quiver, then you see it stops at a four here. And you see that the two next to it is uh, overbalanced. That means if, because it's overbalanced, we can remove the affinity Dinkin diagram such that the remaining or the residual leftover quiver is still a good quiver defined by this two node, right? So, so that's why sort of this fission is possible in terms of the magnetic quiver. Uh, Ami, you have a question? What is the uh, symplectic singularity in this case? Um, the, so in the left, I can see that I can I can get information by computing the Hilbert's, but uh, on the right? Yeah, uh, fair, fair point. So the, the point is, if you go back to the square picture, right? So if you compute the square, you get um, the Hilbert's of this entire symplectic singularity. If you would go to this point in, in, in here where you have this product of quivers, then of course, if you compute the, the Hibbert series of this product of quivers as it stands there, you would not compute the correct Hassel diagram. Or you would not compute the, 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 the Hibbert series of this slice in this bigger um, Hassel diagram. But the, the reason is the same as in, uh, in the instant modelized space uh, paper that the a uh, Hassel diagram of a, a slice in a bigger Hassel diagram doesn't need to be the sub diagram, right? So, so you, you, if you compute the, the Hibbert series of this product, you're not computing really the Hibbert series of this slice. You're computing the Hibbert series of this product. So, so you're saying that uh, you you could tell the uh, Hassel diagram of this particular uh, singularity, but uh, you're not able to say additional information, ad additional properties. Let, let, that's less, less pessimistic. You're not able to compute uh, all the chances like this, right? Uh, you're not because when, whenever you want to compute a slice that sort of uh, stops at a, at a direct product, then you wouldn't compute the right thing. But for other things, if you compute the slices between two you know, single quivers, you still would be mostly fine. I see. Right. It's, it's the same with the decorations. If you have a Hassel diagram for decorations, if you compute something that touches the decoration, you're sort of in trouble. But if you compute something else, then uh, you're mostly fine. I see. Okay. So it, how, how would you um, formulate the, the challenge, the problem here? To, to try and this. It's, it's... It's probably, a, it's probably a dual challenge um, to compute the Hibbert series of a quiver with decoration or compute the, the Hibbert series of a product inside uh, a bigger modular space. I see. In, in the end, it should essentially be the same thing. And you cannot get it by applying some residues or uh, any other operations. Um, maybe. Maybe well, I mean, the, that, better for the discussion afterwards. No? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> let's let's continue for now since we're already you know like uh, <laughs> going all into right. the hour and then let's uh, there will be all Thank the you. time. Sure, sure. Very good. <laughs> um, good. Very good. Then let me go back to this vision example. Uh, I told you why it's sort of possible on in terms of the magnetic quiver. Uh, long story short, um, there was a node next to the point where we subtracted the affine Dinkin quiver. That one was uh, overbalanced, so we could still remove the eight. And then the residual theory would still, or the, the, the resulting quiver would still be a good quiver. In terms of brain systems, um, it is also uh, possible to see. 
So you would get this uh, brain system for this magnetic quiver, and you have the uh, eight half and S brains because you have uh, four and five brains in the original setup. And then what you essentially need to do is you need to uh, separate two half and S brains and move them up. But of course, in order to define a well-defined six-dimensional theory, so you're not just moving the NS brains up, but you also need to move substantially or sufficiently many uh, D6 brains such that if you want to move out the NS brain from the or interval away, you still need to define a, a meaningful six-dimensional theory. So that means in order to do this, you need to uh, take all these six brains uh, together on the right with the NS brains. So then this defines you the E string theory. And then you can you can check that this resulting brain system still defines a, a meaningful six dimensional theory, which then is essentially this one here, right? So you just separate the, the brain system into two. That, that's what gives you the product. But on the, on the same token, you can also see that the initial theory cannot fission. In terms of magnetic quivers, um, it cannot fission because the, the uh, finite Dinkin quiver would sort of stop at the four here. And you see that a neighboring node is already good. So if you would try to remove the eight, um, sorry, if you would try to remove the eight, then the, the neighboring node would be bad and we were stuck and we wouldn't have a meaningful theory. In terms of brain systems, you can try to do the same thing. You would move uh, two half an S uh, up together with the uh, right number of D6 brains. And that would define your knee string. But then on the remaining brain system, you could try to pull out the NS brains from the orange foot, and you would see that you get into trouble with the boundary conditions because you don't have enough NS brains to suspend the NS, uh, the, the six brains uh, to get a well defined six dimension theory. Right? So you can see it in both ways. And lastly, there's of course also the, the Hicksing where you uh, retain the curve configuration and just Hicks away all the, the gauge algebras. So then you would uh, end up with the Easting, uh, the, the, the rank four Easting theory. And then of course we know what is happening to four and five points inside the M9. Those four can either split into three and one or two and two. And then you get the corresponding uh, six dimension theories as well as the corresponding magnetic force. Right? So long story uh, short, we are already over time. Let me summarize. So what we have proposed uh, in, in these two articles is that there is this decaying fission algorithm. And you can look at it in two ways. If you're interested in 3D and equals for Coulomb branches, then the decaying fission algorithm really computes the Coulomb branch Hassel diagram of a unitary uh, quiver. It can be nonsense lace, it can be funnily shaped, it can have uh, uh, a joint. And you compute the Coulomb branch Hassel diagram from a very simple principle, that is you keep the adjacency matrix fixed and you compute any quiver that is smaller in rank and still defines a good quiver. In a subsequent step, you really then compute a tr uh, transition geometry, either from doing subtraction in the decay case or by some other rule in the fission. And again, we need to highlight that really here, you don't need to assume uh, some complete list of minimal degenerations and then further assuming that for each of these minimal degenerations, you know all the quiver realizations that fall in this class of unit quivers. But here we really compute this as a secondary step, which then allowed us to uh, start to scan for new isolated symplectic singularities because now we can really just compute from a quiver and see what is the corresponding hassle diagram and, and the transitions. If you're not happy with three and eight for branches, you can also just think about hex branches in terms of the magnetic quiver program. And then as I hopefully have shown you, you can now use the magnetic quivers to really explore these hex branch or GFOs because now what quiver, uh, what decaying fission does, it gives you the magnetic quivers after hexing. So while having the information of uh, the magnetic quivers after Hicksing, you can then really try to see what is the corresponding theory that we have Hicks to in cases where we don't really know what's going on in the first place. With this, thank you very much. And if you have four qu further questions, please uh, let us know. All right, let's thank Markus. And um, yes, let's have questions. I guess both Antoine and Markus will be available. Hello, Hello. I, 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 mute, please. Oh, I, I do have a, a question. Uh, is there a problem uh, when you have adjoints or in, in, in some of the nodes? No, no. Okay, okay maybe I. I have some harder questions. Answer, yes. No, the, the basic one is no, there is no problem. So in the um, in the adjacency matrix, you just put the number, 
you know, in, instead of minus two, you put minus two plus two times the number of adjoints and just run with it. Okay, the only problem, uh, let's not hide it under the, the carpet is, we, we don't fully know what is the geometry of the transverse slice corresponding to fission. Um, in this case, if you have many adjoints. And I think this will be, well, Julius told me that there is some work in progress or, um, uh, so yeah, th th there is there is a little ambiguity about the the geometry of the transverse slice. Maybe actually I see that Chunhao is here as well, so maybe he knows. I don't know exactly who who is working on this, but yeah. Okay. Maybe this was... But for the diagram, it's it's completely you known. It's it's just the uh, yeah, the yeah. geometry. Thanks. Oh yeah, uh, and to add to Antoine's comment, yeah. So when you have uh, gauge rule with many different adjoints. And then we do this decay and fission, and the quiver you get after doing this decay and fission with many adjoints is still definitely correct. And this will be the magnetic quiver to some theory. It's just that the transfer slides before and after, this is the mysterious part. But the end product, we know for sure what it is. Yeah. Could I ask a, this is kind of a general question about um, what's what's our, the status of our understanding of what um, uh, Higgs branches can be described by unitary magnetic quivers? Are there are there is there a larger class that's known, and is there a are, are there prospects for sort of extending to anyway? I'll just leave it at that. I don't know if Marcus, you, I can say basically the, the thing I, I said already before that definitely we know it doesn't cover all cases. For instance, presumably having autosymplectic quivers in addition to just unitary already strictly extends the, the landscape. Um, this is also what we found in, in, the, in this paper that we had a few years ago with uh, Mario and, and Gabby and Julius on the rank two, you know, the rank two for the n equal two SCFT is that we we try to as hard as we can to find first unitary quivers. And I think in 60% of the cases we could find one. And then uh there was oh, another twenty percent in which we had the autosymplectic and then another twenty percent where we don't have any kind of quiver. So and presumably of course if you increase the ranks so if you increase the complexity of the Higgs branch fewer and fewer cases will be covered by these simple tools. But on the other hand, we also know that there is, for instance, these decorated quivers, which extend significantly the scope. And we don't exactly know uh, by how much, because we don't have full control over what this gives. Okay. So yeah, it's, the, the, the border is kind of blurry, I would say. I have an example for these decorated quivers that's outside of quiver subtraction. So then if you take instantons in a product group then uh, and you take multiple ones, then you get various cones depending kind of where the instanton goes. And if they're kind of split, then you will have a decorated quiver as the full cone. So it's not even a product of doing any subtraction, but it's just like that. And so this will already be a something that's not a unitary quiver. It goes beyond this, but it shows up. Yeah. Do we have more questions for Antoine and Marcus? Yeah, I, I have two questions, if I can ask you. Um, but so before, before that, Federico, uh, just for the comment of uh, um, of uh, Julius, uh, would you consider this the set as uh, slices in the affine Dasmanian of affine type? No, it would be like like a product of two affine things, maybe. But it's not so simple. It's not just an a fine group, and then you take slices in the fine mm -hmm. Go ahead. But I can I can show them at some point. Um, okay, so I have two questions. One is that since this algorithm seems uh, extremely simple, have you tried to do exactly the same thing for orthosymplectic quivers? That's the uh, first question. Not yet. 
I mean, just literally the same, keep the same quicker shape, reduce the nodes, keep a balancing condition, and check in some example if uh, you reproduce a non asset diagram. It's, um, it's quite. It's, it's quite tricky because um, the balancing condition for also synthetic quivers, like how defined by Gaiotu and Witten, we know that there's many quivers that violate this balancing condition, but nevertheless, the coolant branch is a perfectly fine hypercalar cone. So I see. then it gets tricky because yeah, if the Hilbert series for these theories always diverge, then I cannot know which one is which. But uh, I think one example is T4 because there's a duel between orthosymplectic and the unitary side. It's very non-trivial, but both should give the exact same acid diagram. So if one's able to reproduce this on the orthosymplectic side as well, I think it's a thing, but I always have challenge. I couldn't, yeah, hold this on. I see. Um, okay, thanks. And so the second question that I have is in your prescription, when you look at the smaller quivers, you want only the good ones. So I was thinking if you relax this and you allow also for ugly cases, then uh, this will be dual to a, a, a quiver with same shape with reduced gauge node plus collection of three twisted hypers. So can you use, and you also already have uh, the smaller quiver, the good quiver without this information of the, the number of three twisted hypers uh, in your uh, collection of uh, uh, smaller quivers. So can you use this extra information to say something about the dimension of the Coulomb branch part that uh, will be on top uh, of this six branch uh, leaf that uh, generally is a mixed branch? I, I didn't really understand the question, I think. So in the in our prescription where you keep only the good ones, yes, you, you do get the dimension of the all the transverse slices just by counting the ranks so what what do you want to what do you want to add the ugly ones i'm saying if you add, add the ugly ones and then you do a, a sequence of gaiotto dualities this will be equal to a quiver that has a same shape uh, all the nodes will be good plus some collection of, uh, of free twisted hypers right yes. then uh, then this will be equal to a quiver that you already have in your list of the smaller quiver plus an extra information that is the one of how many free twisted hypers you have. Can you use this information in any way? That is, the... I think this information you already you already have. I I don't. Yeah, maybe also this we can keep for yeah. the later. Yeah, this yeah, go on. Just say one thing. Of course, the 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 first. Like knowing the geometry or the, the dimension is is another you know, is another thing. But first of all, the the order zero statement is that the the set of of uh, good of well, the set of sets of good quivers they are really in bijection with the leaves, and that's like if you add ugly quivers, this would not hold anymore. So it's really no no this this I understand. But if you yeah. add an ugly quiver and then you do a sec uh, sequence of gradient dualities, this would be equal. To one of the good quivers that yeah, we yeah. have, plus uh, some free, uh, some free twisted hypers. So you don't introduce other leaves. You just uh, add an extra information yeah. that uh, you don't have. Uh, well, I don't know. It's just yeah, some, you, I was yeah. thinking of it. You can just reduce the rank of one node by one, and yes. then do this, and that's just equivalent to doing the full Higgsing. So that's it's. Yeah. So you will reach an ugly quiver, but then. When you get rid of all the free hypers, the, the free hypers will then kind of vibrate the transfer slice and then enhance it. So you always end up as a good quiver in the end. I'm guessing you're coming from the idea that many of the Argyrus Douglas theories, when you competify and find a 3D mirror, there'll be some free twisted hypers with them. And you also need these free twisted hypers with the magnetic quiver to fully define the Argyrus Douglas theories. So in this case, I think you should start with the Argyrus Douglas theory that already have these free twisted hypers. So then when you do Hicksing, you don't care about the free twisted hypers. They always come with you every single step. So then you kind of stay within the same family of Argyrus Douglas theories when you do the Hicksing. But if you start with Argyrus Douglas theory, it's magnetic quiver that you know does not have any twisted hypers, then after Hicksing, this will be more magnetic quivers that corresponds to, that doesn't have free hypers. So they always stay in the same family when you do the Hicksing.
Okay, do we have more questions for Antoine and Marcus? If not, I would say uh, let's thank both of them. And we can go off the record. <laughs>